foolish actions. And we've all done them, haven't we? Actions that make someone else look at us and say, what were they thinking? One of the more popular segments on ESPN's Monday Night Countdown leading up to the Monday Night Football game is when the hosts of the show choose knucklehead plays from games that were played the day before. And then they show them to the viewers and then they conclude with, come on, man. And what in essence they are asking is, what were they thinking? There's a similar segment in the magazine, The Week, and it's entitled, Only in America. They have similar stories. Here's one. It pays to do your research, especially when it comes to counterfeiting money. Now, Michael Smith of Lexington, North Carolina, is facing felony charges after trying to pay for $476 worth of purchases at the local Walmart with a fake million-dollar bill. <laughs> now, store clerks, the article says, we're skeptical. The $100 bill is the largest currently in circulation, and $100,000 is the top note ever issued briefly printed in the 1930s. The arrest warrant's conclusion on the ersatz million dollar bill, there is no such thing. Come on, man, what were you thinking? Or how about another one? Unemployed for two years, Eric Henderson, Pensacola, Florida, finally got a job at the local Circle K. Things were going well, he says, until two women and a man tried to rob the convenience store at gunpoint. As the thieves yelled, shoot him, shoot him, Henderson says he grabbed the gun wielder around the neck, slammed her to the ground, and disarmed her. Now, unfortunately, saving his life and Circle K's cash cost Henderson his job for the heroics violated company policy against provoking, chasing, or engaging with robbers. Come on, man. What were you thinking? Do you know, we shake our heads in disbelief at stories like that, and yet haven't we all made some knucklehead moves that cause someone else to look at us and say, Man, here's an example that isn't terribly unusual. Running out of gas. I mean, a lot of us have done that, and it usually warrants a rather gentle man. But there are those who can take running out of gas to a whole new level. It's bad enough to run out of gas. But when you do it, after your wife has been begging you to stop for 50 miles and you refuse because you're looking for a cheaper price, you are moving into dangerous territory. <laughs> now add to that setting that it's late at night, like midnight late at night. Then to make it even worse, you've got three young children in the car. Now here's the bunch of you're not driving from Evansville to St. Louis, you're not driving from Evansville to Indianapolis, but rather you are halfway across the state of South Dakota. <laughs> the state that's about 2,000 miles wide and has a gas station and an exit about every 500 miles. <laughs> so you go ahead and put it together. Emma Sue had been begging me to stop for 50 miles at past midnight. We got all three young boys under the age of 10 in the car, and we are in the middle of nowhere. And that's where I chose to run out of gas. And that surely warranted a very hearty, come on, man, what was I thinking? Do you know if we would admit it, every one of us has been there. I hope all of that 
can sufficiently set the stage for this passage and this parable that we have just read in Mark's Gospel. Jesus had challenged the religious authorities in driving out the money changers in the temple. And now, immediately prior to the passage we have just read, he's had a confrontation with those same religious leaders as they questioned his authority. And now he tells them a parable. And it is a parable that would have been clearly understood by anyone who was listening. It's a parable about a landowner who lived far away. And he sent various representatives to collect the rent that he was owed from those tenants. And every representative who showed up, every single one of them, was either beaten or killed. And finally, in exasperation, the landowner sent his own son. It was the thinking that surely, surely they won't abuse him. Surely they will pay him what is owed. Now, but the tenants killed the son as well. And the landowner himself finally arrives on the scene and gives those tenants what they have come for their lack of obedience. Now, when Jesus told this parable, it was pretty clear that Jesus was saying that the landowner was God. And the religious leaders were the tenants. And the prophets of the Old Testament and even John the Baptist were the early representatives, those who were abused and killed by the religious leaders. And now finally, the son of the landowner, the son of God, Jesus himself, has been sent to require the religious leaders to pay up, to do what was right by God. Now, the religious leaders, when they hear this parable, are absolutely incensed. They are outraged. Now, first of all, that Jesus would question them and their authority, and secondly, that he would claim to be the one who was sent by the landowner, the one who was sent by God. But let's, let's take a closer look at this parable. And the, the tenants decide that after killing everyone else the landowner had sent, his son comes. And they decide that what they will do is just kill him as well. And then they will inherit the land. Now think about this. Does this make any sense at all? Why on earth would they ever think that there was a chance in the world that this was going to happen? You see, it's not like the landowner had disappeared. Why in the world would they think they could just kill the son and then inherit the property themselves? Come on, man! What were they thinking? This made absolutely no sense at all. But you know what? Those tenants, or these religious leaders, aren't the only ones in this story who deserve a come on man. Or I think the landowner himself warrants that even bigger. Come on, man. I mean, just look at what he did. He sent a servant. The servant was killed. He sent another one. He was beaten. But he didn't give up. He sent another, and he too was beaten and abused, and still the landowner didn't quit. He sent another servant, and then he sent another, and then he sent another, and another, and another. He did not give up. Each time the result was the same. The tenants refused to do as they knew they were supposed to do. But the landowner didn't give up on them. And finally decided to send his very own son to 
to take care of things. And that warrants a huge, come on, man, what was he thinking? Why in the world would this landowner think that things would be any different with his son than they had been with everyone else who had gone before? them to do the right thing. He wanted so badly to give them every opportunity to do what was right. And now we have to ask, what about us? Are we not very much like those tens? Are we not very much like those religious leaders, those Use to pay the rent. But you see, what it comes down to is that we don't want the landowner to be in charge. No, we want to be in charge ourselves. And every Sunday morning with our lips, we say, Thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory. And then all week with our actions, we declare, Mine is the kingdom and power and glory. See, we want to be the one in charge. So what is it then that God asks of us? What, what, what is it that is the rent that God wants to collect? Well, I think the answer comes from Jesus in Jerusalem. It comes from immediately what precedes and immediately what follows this parable. God requires that our house of worship be a house of prayer for all people. God requires our community to be a loving one. God requires that we are to render to God what belongs to God. We are to love God with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our strength and with all our mind. And we are to love our neighbors as ourselves. You see, in other words, God expects us as tenants in his vineyard to be an accepting, a prayerful, a forgiving, a committed, a loving fellowship built around his son. The one stone, the cornerstone that binds everything else together. And the divine foolishness, I dare call God a knucklehead, the divine foolishness will do everything, will try everything, will sacrifice everything, even his own son, to give us the opportunity to get it right. That's the positive side of the come on, man, declaration, isn't it? <laughs> so I wonder, how can you, how can I, how can we do something so outrageously loving as that? That's what God was willing to do. Here's let's face it, you and I are going to do some knucklehead things in life. And why not decide that the knucklehead actions that we take, the actions that made people say, come on, man, what were you thinking? Why not make those things positive things? I think about it. Why not try? Why not try individually and collectively as a church? to do some things that are so compassionate, so daring, so risky, so outrageously loving, that others will simply look at you and look at us and shake their heads and say, come on, man, what were you thinking? 